We're flying over the Peak District in the very heart of England. Beneath us are a series of magnificent dams and reservoirs built to provide a much needed water supply for Britain's rapidly expanding cities. But in the dash to create these new sources of water, hundreds of lives would be lost and whole communities destroyed forever. In the middle of the Peak District lies the Derwent Valley, home to one of the largest reservoir systems in Britain. Holding back these huge bodies of water are three dams at Howden, Derwent and Ladybower. Built in the early 20th century, they took 45 years to complete. The result of a massive engineering challenge first taken up by the Victorians. Look at this part. This is Derwent Dam we're passing over now. But look at the scale of it. I mean, what audacity for the Victorians to even think they could change the landscape like this. They're fantastic constructions, absolutely enormous. I and mean, of course there were dams like that being built all over Britain at the time to, to bring fresh water to the new industrial cities. Yeah, but the amazing thing is, can you see how low the water level has gone to this summer? The beauty of it is, from our point of view, it's beginning to reveal some of the sacrifice that was made in order that these valleys could be flooded. I mean, if you look below, for example, that pile of stones, that's the remains of a farm and a couple of gateposts. But look, I can see sort of walls and so forth down there. You know, they would never have thought that their houses would be visible again, not 90 years after they moved out. No, absolutely not. With the 19th century industrial revolution, Britain's cities expanded at a furious rate. As conditions in the cities worsened, water supplies became increasingly inadequate. Disease soon ran riot, with cholera wiping out thousands of people. A clean water supply was desperately needed. The pioneering Victorians rose to the challenge constructing vast reservoirs which could store millions of gallons of water. With its huge valleys, the Peak District was an ideal place to build such reservoirs. Geologist Hermione Coburn has joined me to explain what drew the Victorians to the area. Well, there's three main things that they would have been looking for, Mark. Firstly, if you want a reservoir, you need a good supply of water. Self-evidently. And, and they get that in the Peak District. I mean, there's a huge amount of rainfall here, so that's number one. Secondly, you need a good landscape. You need the right shape of valley. And over here, you can see the Peak District is full of quite steep-sided, narrow valleys that provide great reservoirs. So it's all easy with a dam across. Yes, put a dam across and you build up a very deep, quite narrow but long reservoir. And thirdly, it boils down to the geology. And the most important geological consideration is that your valley has to be watertight. Um, because there's no point in building a dam if all the water is going to seep out around the sides and seep through the rocks. In 19th century Britain, the most common dams built were massive embankments constructed of soil. At the heart of these dams were large watertight cores made from clay, which prevented water from seeping through them into the valleys beneath. One of the earliest projects was the massive dam at Dale Dyke. Designed to carry water to nearby Sheffield, this huge embankment would take five years to complete. What we're flying over here is the Dale Dyke. This was the style that was favoured in the mid-19th century, but they weren't always terribly successful. What we're seeing there is the new dam. But down in the trees is the site of the original Dale Dyke Dam. It was hoped that the Dale Dyke project would fulfil Sheffield's rapidly growing water supply needs. 
But as construction drew to a close in March 1864, disaster hit the project. As the reservoir filled for the first time, the massive pressure of the water behind it caused the dam to suddenly breach. As a hole, several hundred feet long and 50 yards wide, tore across the earthwork, a torrent of water came crashing through, flooding the valley for eight miles. 244 people lost their lives. And the Dale Dyke tragedy became the biggest disaster to have ever hit peacetime Britain. What actually happened on that fateful night? Well, it was the 11th of March, 1864, and the dam was nearing completion. And there was a workman on his way home, a guy called William Horsfield. And as he walked across the top of the dam, he noticed a small crack running the length of it. He was sufficiently alarmed to call upon the engineer who was based in Sheffield. It wasn't until 10 o'clock that night that a group of engineers got out to the dam to look at it more closely. It was a very stormy night. They couldn't really get a good look. And suddenly, without really any warning at all, the entire middle section of the dam was blown out by the water gushing downstream. And that's the bit that we're standing in at the moment. Yeah, we're standing right in the middle of the breach. It occurred right in the centre of the dam. An investigation into the disaster concluded that the devastation was a result of unsuitable geology under the dam and a badly designed clay core. With the need for water still a priority, the Victorians wasted no time in rebuilding the Dale Dyke. But when a new reservoir was completed a decade later, it was still not enough to satisfy Sheffield's thirst. Some 40 years later, the tragedy of Dale Dyke was to have a direct impact on the Derwent Valley water scheme. In 1899, two new reservoirs were commissioned to provide the industrial cities of the north with water. The man appointed to mastermind the scheme was Victorian engineer Edward Sanderman. Sanderman's task was to be huge. Not only did he have to design a system to store the water, he also had to build a network of underground pipelines and huge aqueducts above the ground, all to carry the water several miles down the valley to a treatment plant with nothing more to move it than gravity. From here, the treated water would then be sent to the nearby cities. Rather than constructing huge earthwork banks, as at Dale Dyke, Sanderman instead opted to build massive masonry dams at both Derwent and Howden. But with such a huge project came a whole set of problems. At the site of Derwent Dam, I met up with Vic Hallam, local historian for the Water Board. Vic, what difficulties did Sanderman have to build a masonry dam here? I think that he knew straight away when he came to the plans that he wanted to build it out of stone rather than soil. And the major problem where to find the massive amounts of stone, which is about one and a quarter million tonnes of stone used on the two projects. Well, you've got hills all around us, surely. We have, but with the ravaging of dam building, they couldn't obtain the stone from this valley. So they established a quarry some ten mile southeast of here at a little right. place called Grindleford. How do they get the stone from Grindleford here? The Derwent Valley Water Board actually constructed their own railway eight and a half miles up into the valley. So when the dam was being built, I mean, how did it all work? You've got the main body of the dam being constructed down in the base of the valley and then leading away from there, the ancillary works for the engine sheds and everything that goes together to keep the whole project going. Massive amounts of crushed stone were needed for concrete. And this area is where the stone was crushed. It was a manually operated plant, so three men were actually there loading the stones in for the various grades. And if you can imagine, probably 12 hours of loading onto the old uh, stone crusher, it was a hard day. So actually, it was really quite a massive operation. A massive operation, and, and really with very small amount of mechanization.
to build these two dams, Sandemann would require a large workforce. The men recruited for the job were known as navvies, named from their trade of building or navigating the country's canal and railway systems. Navvies had been exploited for decades. Earning little money and shunned by society, they had roamed the country with their families in tow from job to job. At Howden Moor, just 10 miles from the Derwent Valley, lies the recently abandoned railway tunnel of Woodhead, built between 1854 and 1864, which once carried the main train route from Sheffield to Manchester. On the moors above the tunnel, amongst the huge spoil heaps produced from the excavation below, lie the remains of huts made from mud in which the navvies once lived. They were stuck right up on top of the moor here, and they lived in appalling conditions. They had like sod huts, very little substantial uh, accommodation or shelter of any kind. So people were getting diseased, the, you know, there's no drainage, no sanitation. And it was when the Derwent Valley Water Board was set up to build the reservoirs, there was an act of parliament that insisted, forced them to provide high standard of accommodation for their navvy workforce. With his new act of parliament, Edward Sanderman would have to provide decent accommodation for his workers. In 1901, Halfway between the two dam sites, the engineer had a village constructed for the navvies, known as Tin Town. Tin Town consisted of two main streets, lined with terraces of small tin huts, from which the village earned its name. As well as housing, there was a school, a hospital, a post office, and even a police station. In the overgrown ruins of the old village, I met up with local historian Brian Robinson, whose grandfather, George Green, was one of the navvies who worked on the dams. In 1906, Brian's mother was born in the village. So, Brian, is this the main street? It is one of the two main streets which came through the village. Well, I can see sort of platforms, presumably, for all the tin huts. The huts were there and on this side as well. But where was your mum's house? Just at the top of this terracing here, at the top of this small bank. Go up and have a look. This is the, where the front wall would have been. So the flat area is where the house must have been then, is it? And I can see there must have been steps going down to the road. And what was it like inside? Was it comfortable? Yes, the walls were wooden lined, the, the usual pictures around the walls. and uh, So it was warm and cosy inside, it wasn't just like a tin hut, but actually oh, no, really, no, really, no, really rather no. comfortable. Yes, indeed so. Living between the two dams at Howden and Derwent, Sandemans navvies both worked and lived together as a single community. But whilst a new village had been raised for the workers, the creation of the dams would mean an enormous sacrifice for those already living in the valley below. For the new reservoirs to exist, several farms would have to be destroyed. With the water levels so low this year, the remains of some of these farms are re-emerging from the depths of the reservoir. At the beginning of the 20th century, the land on which these farms once stood was owned by the Duke of Norfolk. And at the local parish council chamber, Vic has unearthed the original plans which show the extent of the Duke's land needed for the project. If you look at this original map that we have here, it shows the high water line and various dwellings in the valley bottom that had to be purchased. Hang on, so we've got what limit of lands to be acquired and intended top water lines. So the whole of this was intended to be flooded. That's right. So how many farms were involved? Well, you've got Hollingscliffe Farm, Hancock's Farm. Further up the valley, you've got 
Abbey Grange, the Abbey Farm. Of course, that's presumed quite an, an ancient place. That's right. And what if the tenants refuse to move? Well, there's an interesting paragraph in the Derwent Valley Minutes where it states the clerk reports a request by the engineer to serve notice to quit upon the tenants. So the poor farmers just had to leave. One must have felt living in this valley, sort of, one was doomed. As the valley was cleared of its inhabitants, work continued on the dams. The navvies had started to build the huge masonry structures from the centre, working their way out slowly towards the edges of the valley, a long, back-breaking process that would take several years. In 1908, however, after seven years of hard toil, a serious problem hit the first of the two dams at Howden. They began building the dam from the middle of the valley out towards the side. Now in the middle, they knew that they had suitable geology. They could make the dam effectively watertight with the dam foundations resting on impermeable beds. The problem they encountered was when in 1908 they started to address the problem of tying in the dam to the valley side, they couldn't find impermeable geology. Of course, if there's no impermeable rock, presumably all the water just floods round the dam and goes down the valley. Exactly, there's no point. However good your dam is, you're still going to lose the water seeping round the side. So they've got this half-finished dam, they spent thousands of pounds on it, but it's actually never going to work. Well, yes, I mean, it was seriously embarrassing for the engineers and the Derwent Valley Water Company were very concerned at the time. I mean, if they hadn't solved the problem, they might have actually had to abandon the project. For months, Sanderman's men continued to dig into the valley sides, desperate to find an impermeable layer of rock. The rocks at the base of the valley were watertight, but the edges were not, meaning water could leak through the sides of the dam to the valley below. With a project in deep crisis, Sanderman came up with a radical solution. He ordered his men to probe further along the valley edges to try and find a watertight rock face elsewhere to which he could connect the dam. A thousand yards up the valley an impermeable rock layer was finally found. A relieved Sanderman ordered the construction of two deep trenches along the length of the valley sides from the newly found watertight rock back towards the dam. The trenches were then filled with concrete, effectively lining the valley with huge walls that made the reservoir completely watertight. This is the spot where they found that all-important impermeable geology. What, so they've built a wall, what, nearly a kilometre from the main dam? That's right. Their solution was to dig a very narrow trench. This is unbelievably about 50 metres deep. Fill it with concrete and effectively line the reservoir and make the dam impermeable. And did it actually work? Yes, it did. It, it was a solution to their problems. Of course, it, it set them back a lot in terms of money, but also time, about a good year or two, but it, it saved the project. What had threatened to be a potential disaster had been overcome with ingenuity and hard graft. After two anxious years, the problem was now solved. Sanderman and his men were back on course. Over the next few years, work continued at a pace until finally the two dams were finished. After much hard work, some 200,000 tonnes of stone at a cost of three and a half million pounds, Howden Dam was completed in 1912 and Derwent in 1916. All that was left was to connect up the reservoirs to the supply network that would take the water to the nearby industrial towns of the north. With Howden and Derwent now operational, it was soon realised that considerably more water was still going to be needed. The solution that the water board came up with was to be a third and final dam, to be known as Lady Bower. 
when the proposed site for the dam was surveyed, it was discovered that the area was geologically unsuitable for another masonry dam. Controversially, the decision was taken to build Lady Bower as an earthwork embankment, similar to the Dale Dyke Dam that had collapsed some 60 years before. So they planned one big massive dam? They did. A different type of dam, an earthwork embankment type dam, which at the time would be the largest in Europe. So it wasn't a masonry dam like this? No, technology had moved on and they felt very, very happy to build an earthwork embankment with a clay core and over-engineer it again. The plan now was to construct a massive super reservoir that would contain more water than the Howden and Derwood reservoirs combined which would be held back by a huge earthwork embankment that would take some 10 years to complete. But there was to be a major obstacle in the way. In the heart of the valley were located two villages of Derwent and Ashopton. The landlord responsible for the villages was the Duke of Norfolk, who was himself based in the local manor of Derwent Hall, a huge stately home which had stood on the outskirts of the village for nearly 300 years. When the Duke decided to sail Derwent Hall to the water board, the villagers' days were to be numbered. Hey! 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 Go again! Come by! As a young boy, local farmer Morris Cottrell went to school in Derwent. He remembers the day when news reached the village of the proposed Lady Bower scheme. Well, they thought it was going to be a disaster, to be honest, but, but, but in those days, you see, it was no good objecting because you didn't object to your landlord and you had to accept what they said. Nothing wrong. I mean, everybody respected them as, as tenants and landlords, but the fact is they wouldn't allow it today. It was a beautiful little village. You know, with, with, with a school, a church, a hall, and a couple of farms, and half a dozen little cottages. But no, it was a special village. With the Duke having sold the land, the way was clear for the creation of the massive Lady Bower Reservoir. The price was to be enormous. The beautiful village of Derwent had existed for hundreds of years as a small agricultural community at the very heart of the valley. This year, with the water levels falling because of drought, the remains of a once proud community are slowly being revealed. On the ground, there are the remains of the bridge that once brought the main road into the heart of Derwent. There's the blackened stumps of trees that once towered over the edges of the village. Amongst the silt, there's the ancient channel of the village's river. And from the air, evidence of the Duke's home of Derwent Hall is also re-emerging from the depths. There's, there's what clearly uh, seems to be a, a, a garden in, in effect. This is the, uh, it's the vegetable garden, it's the walled garden that went with Derwent Hall. Derwent Hall itself was just to the north of the village, on the other side of the inlet mark. And actually there's no trace of it, it's all still underwater because it, the hall was right down on what would have been the riverside. And I'm going towards a, a heap of stones at the end here. Well, Mark, I can actually tell you that that was the church for the village. There's a really good bit of carved stone down here. It's got a date, 1861, or appears to be a consecration cross. Do you know, Mark, that means that the church had a life of less than 100 years. In 1943, the church, the focal point of the community for nearly a hundred years, 
was to be the place where the villagers bade their final goodbye to Derwent. It is a day which still stays in the minds of the villagers. I can remember it really as if it was yesterday because uh, it was full. Well, there was this somber feeling you know, when people came out and just stood about talking. It was like a funeral in a sense, and it was the end of an era. When construction on the Lady Bower Dam was finally finished in 1945, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were invited to unveil a commemorative plaque celebrating the accomplishment of this massive feat of engineering. As the reservoir slowly began to fill, the spire of the church was allowed to remain standing as an unofficial memorial a reminder of a once proud community. Today, the spire of the church no longer stands. When the water levels fell for the first time during a drought, souvenir hunters were attracted to the site from which they took many stones, making the area increasingly dangerous to visit. Reluctantly, in 1950, it was decided that the tower itself should go. With the completion of Lady Bower, the water supply problem for the neighbouring industrial cities was finally solved. The Derwent Valley was now one of the largest reservoir systems in Europe. You know, Dave, I've been most impressed by these dams. Oh, I know. You, you just couldn't fail to be, could you? The scale of it is enormous. And, you know, I actually find it a little bit scary standing underneath it like this. But they're on such a massive scale. Yeah, but, it, I mean, yeah, that's dramatic. But the thing that strikes me is the sacrifice people made so that these dams could be created. You know, we've seen the remains of villages. We've seen the remains of farms. We've seen the remains of big country house and garden. Mm -hmm. You know, it was people at all levels of society actually gave up everything virtually in order that these could be built and the valleys flooded and in order that the industrial towns and cities of the north had a decent water supply yeah exactly with the system still operational today the derwent valley engineers had succeeded in the huge challenge set by the victorians Next Tuesday, Dan Cruikshank discovers the secret history of one of London's landmarks, Tower Bridge in Britain's best buildings at 7.30 here on BBC Two.